I first met Olympio while reading about her in the January 2015 issue of the Rotarian Magazine. It featured six full pages about a lady who was a rocket scientist involved in our space shuttle programs. She's a noteworthy communicator and accomplished TED speaker. She's a national celebrity with much to say about leadership and service. And finally, she is a Rotarian of the Rotary Club of Los Angeles. I've waited two years for this moment today. With that, we are all in for an amazing treat. In support of this lady is her mother, Pamela LaPointe. Please feel free to take out your notepads or iPads and take notes and learn to unleash the true power of your brain and be transformed into a more powerful leader. Please give a warm rotary welcome to this session's very special presenter, Olympia LaPointe. Ten, nine, eight, pressures are good. Six, five, four, Val Tommy nominal. Three, two, one, we're good to go. Lift off. 5,000 miles, no excessive vibrations. 10,000 miles, valve timing good. 17,000 miles, yes, we're in outer space. Welcome, Rotary. That was me, a rocket scientist, sitting in mission control. And a lot of people always ask me, what was it like? What was it like to be a rocket scientist? And I'm today going to share with you a story that transformed the way that I saw myself and the way that I saw my role in the world and what it is that I could do. Now, uh, it was so fascinating. Uh, people always ask me about what it was like to launch, and so I have a couple of photos for you. I used mathematics and science to calculate the probability of catastrophic explosions in flight. And yes, what you're looking on the screen are real mathematical equations. And this is what we use to make sure that we could launch into outer space successfully. Now, I worked on the Space Shuttle main engine project and program, and uh, it was amazing. Uh, the program retired in 2011. And as you can see here, and many of you remember, uh, it was the way that we transported our astronauts to space. We had the Space Shuttle itself, we had the external boosters, and we also had the external tank, and that is comprised of the Space Shuttle program. Uh, this was one of the most ex wonderful experiences I ever had. Uh, it was in Florida. It was STS-109. It was when uh, I saw a launch close-up. And most amazing thing about this is when I saw this launch close-up, it was three miles away. That's the closest we could get to the launch itself because it was so explosive. We sat three miles away in the closest bleachers, and we saw the space shuttle head up, and it was this gigantic blowtorch. It looked like that in the sky. And a couple of seconds later, the sound waves came. And if you know science, sound waves travel slower than light waves. And this vibration almost shook our clothes off. It was one of the most exciting experiences I've ever had. Now, the space shuttle program, as you can see, uh, had the external uh, boosters on the side. They're basically firecrackers. Once you light them, you gotta stand back because there's no way that you could turn them off. I worked specifically on the space shuttle program and it was the space shuttle main engine was my specialty. There's three of them that was used to launch the space shuttle into space. It was powered, do you see that plume? that light colored plume, it was made of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And that's what allowed us to actually fly to outer space, high powered steam. 
Now, to give you a feel for uh, this engine, this is what we worked on. And this is a huge engine. It is close to two stories tall. You may not be able to see that in this picture, but you can here. I'm standing around 50 feet away from the engine itself. That's the type of engineering and machinery and science that we use to get into space. And I was so honored because I had the opportunity to work on this, to launch us into space, to go where only several people who were astronauts were able to go. And I was so thankful. Uh, here I am outside of the uh, Endeavor exhibit at the California Science Center. And the California Science Center has the air, all sorts of different space exhibits. And I was so thankful we took this picture out, uh, our, directly outside of Endeavor. I helped launch 28 missions to space, Columbia, Atlantis, Endeavor, and Discovery Space Shuttles. And I'm so honored for that opportunity. Now, I wasn't always going to be a rocket scientist. But I had a type of situation that happened in my life that allowed me to change the way I was thinking about myself. For me, uh, I wasn't planning to go into rocket science. Rather, I was raised in a poverty-stricken area, had no food. I was so excited to go to school because it wasn't just the education I was excited about. It was the fact that I could get a, a meal. And I was in such, such difficult situations. But there was a blessing. When I was six years old, we went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I saw for the first time rocket engines. And I saw these big screens on the wall, and I saw pictures of these men launching rockets. And I said to myself, I want to be just like those men. Now, I'm not quite sure if you noticed. <laughs> I'm not a man. But that didn't stop me. I knew I wanted to make a difference. But every time we have something in front of us, sometimes we come across challenges. Years later, in difficult situations, I ended up failing algebra, failing geometry, failing calculus and chemistry. <laughs> have you ever failed a math class? Have you ever had a child that you cared about fail in math class. It just completely destroyed my confidence. And it wasn't until someone volunteered their time, just like you have the opportunity to volunteer your time to make a difference in someone's life, what would change the trajectory of their life. And for me, what happened for me is that there was an 11th grade teacher that sat down with me and volunteered his time and tutored me in mathematics. And it wasn't until that moment in time that I realized that I had to change the way that I saw myself. I had to change the way that I thought I could operate. I had to change the way that I saw the type of contributions I would make. And then I had to make this decision. Once I started taking these classes again and deciding, okay, I've got to take this math over and I'm going to do this, I had to realize this. Failure is not your option. It wasn't mine. I decided failure was not going to be my option. I decided I was going to find a way and I was not going to accept failure. How many times have you let failure stop you? How many times have you allowed a situation to discourage you where you didn't move forward? And you are a leader. And I want, I, I'm so happy I'm talking here because this organization is one in which I am so passionate about. Because we, each one of us, every single one of us here in this room, are leaders. 
We're the ones to change society. We're the ones to change the way the world is operating. But it requires us to stand up and get out there and not accept failure as an option. And I didn't, in my case. I graduated at Cal State Northridge in mathematics out of one out of top five out of a 6,500 graduating class. I did not let failure be my option. So I graduated and I entered into a world where everyone was not like I was. Uh, if, uh, if you think of a rocket scientist, do, do you envision someone standing in front of you like me? <laughs> no. So here I was sitting in this uh, room and uh, I actually almost let fear stop me again. And I remember sitting here in this room as I was, um, it was like this large room, it was around 200 people in the room, and I looked around and I was the only woman, and I was the youngest person. I started working as a rocket scientist when I was 21. And um, I'm still young now, thankfully. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but uh, I started when I was 21, and I was hired to make a difference. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how, how, what can I do? Everyone's here is so much more experienced than I am, and what difference can I make? And I realized we are each placed in a position to make a change because it was only us who can do it. It is only us who can make a change. We have a specific mission. And so as I was sitting in this room, and I let, almost let fear creep up on me again, I thought to myself, how, how am I going to make a difference? And then I'm like, wait. I've, I've gotten through poverty. I've gotten through a failing education. And I graduated at top of my class, and now I finally landed into the role in which I saw myself doing Huh, am I going to let my own doubts stop me? And that's when I realized this. You have to replace no with how. Oftentimes, you will hear no. You will be a leader, and you will hear no. Here I was, as a young person in this room, everyone else no, you can't make a difference. How could you? You're so young. And I realized the gift that I had in thought. I had to change no into how. How am I going to make a difference? I'm not going to accept no. There is always a way. Your job is to figure out how. When things happen and they don't happen the way that you anticipate they will happen, it's your trigger, and it's your opportunity for you to figure out another way that actually may be better for you and better for everyone who you are working with. So you have to replace no with how. Next, you have to realize that smart and sexy equals success. <laughs> sexy. It's appealing. Obviously, I realized I was working in that environment. I was not going to blend in with anyone that was working there. And I saw women that would cut their hair short. I saw women that would wear pants. Uh, try to wear big jackets so it was less obvious that they were a woman. But I decided to change it around. I was going to be a woman, and I was going to do my thing. I was going to be Olympia Lapointe. And once I embraced the fact that I was going to be Olympia Lapointe and no one else, that's when I realized my success. You are in a position of leadership. You have the ability to make what it is that you know sexy. You have a new generation of people coming into Rotary that are younger, that are hungry, that are wanting to do great things. How can you make it sexy for them? How can you make it appealing? 
Marketing is always one third of the task of making something so successful that people will go crazy just to get near it. How can you do that for your organization? How can you make it so that your organization stands out amongst, amongst all the ones in your area where you have a chance to draw in not only the intelligence and the leadership that you bring to the world, but market it and bring it so people will want to say, yeah, I'm a part of Rotary. Are you? And lastly, your talents are limitless. Your talents are limitless. And that's what I realized when I was working as a scientist. See, we don't just deal with the left side of the brain, which is the scientific, the analytical side. And we don't just deal with the right side of the brain, which is creative. I have defined, uh, in, and I write on the Huffington Post, and I'm very thankful for that opportunity, I define the Trier brain. And the Trier brain is uh, the three-sided part of the brain. And I define the third side of the brain as the faith sector. Now this faith sector connects the left and right sides of the brain and it's also responsible for innovation. Every single scientist had to see the invention before it was made. Every single leader has to have a vision inside of their head, so much so you can explain it to everyone who you are working with so they can see the same thing that you can see. It was when these scientists realized that they had that power of their brain, power of their thought, power to see something that no one else could, but they had the ability to bring it into existence, is what made them successful. We each have that ability to bring something into the world fresh and new and exciting, but it's only if we realize that there's no limits to what we can do. There's no limits. The only limits that you have is the ones that you place on yourself. What limits have you been placing on your own ability to lead in a way that will transform not only your club, but your entire community will, that will look at you and the people that you work with as the teacher who changed my life, the leader who will change the lives of people who are looking for help, the leader who will lead when times are rough and will change the trajectory of people's lives so they can do anything they want to do. Thank you for that clap. <laughs> because when you realize you can do anything that you want to do, you can do anything, even become a rocket scientist. It has been my pleasure to hear, be here with you today. You can find me always, and the way you can find me is through my website, AnswersUnleashed.com. You can find out all about great things like this. And I'm so thankful to be here with you today. And if there's something that you will take with you for the rest of your life, it will be this. You are placed in your position and in your role for such a powerful time as this. You have the ability to change lives simply by being who you are. I am Olympia LaPointe, and it has been my pleasure to speak with you today.
Olympia. As one, as one smart and sexy person to another, thank you for being here today. <laughs> I received that, that's cool. <laughs> Apparently it's a rotary tradition to give certificates that are not framed. We have one of those for you, in our appreciation. However, you're a pocket scientist, you can probably make your own frame. So, if that's for you. And a gift from all of us. Thank you so much for the words that you've given us, the inspiration that you've provided. It's a great way to start the day, isn't it? And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.